everyone. I hope you can uh, see my screen. I mean, Hang on a um, second. I my... got to switch to you. OK. All right, there you go. Now you're live. All right, thank you so much. Um, so let me actually start sharing my screen here and get going. All right, so thank you all for having me. It's always great to be here with, uh, with you folks. I see a lot of familiar names on the attendee list. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Mohammed. I work in the office of the CTO at Seagate. Um, my primary job is to just um, get our company moving in the right direction as far as open source is concerned. I also run the open source program office where we try to figure out how we can best enable our engineers to be more productive with open source, but also going back to contributing to you know, open source projects such as FreeBSD. We were really hoping before the COVID hit and Deb and I talked about it to have some sort of a meetup at the uh, office we have in Longmont that didn't pan out, but we're hoping that once this is all done, uh, we, we will be able to host you guys. So with that, let me just get started. Um, there's some legal stuff that I'm required to kind of talk about, mainly because I'm going to be talking about some things which may or may not pan out from a product perspective. So uh, just um, let's stay for that. So um, we in accordance with IDC actually did a study on data and trying to figure out where uh, the data sprawl is going. And that study is actually available on the website. Feel free to come download it. But basically what we found out is that very small amount of data is stored and most of the data is not. And we're just trying to figure out how um, we can enable more of that data to be managed and stored efficiently. But also my job at CEGA is to make sure we have uh, open source ecosystems and open infrastructures in place to actually manage and store that data. And so I'm always looking at what projects are all in the pipeline, how we can you know, use them, and also how we can enable others to use them. At the end of the day, it's all about the data that you guys produce and other companies produce, things like that. So I know most of you see Seagate as a device manufacturer and, and, and on top of that, just an SSD and maybe hard drive manufacturer, but we have research going on in pretty much every level. So data creation, which can be, you know, in many cases in the factories or nowadays, you know, with the cars and everything, how that data is moved, how to keep it secure. There's a whole lot of research going on in data provenance. So figuring out when the data is being moved is it being tampered, making sure the fingerprints are on? How do you manage in such a large data infrastructure? Where can we help? Uh, where can we learn from others? And then data infrastructure in place in general, um, how the edge is gonna be and things like that. So all of that is in our wheelhouse. We always are talking to um, communities, those who are trying to create open source solutions for this, including you guys. Um, and so we're always, willing to do partnerships to see how we can help in, in this regard. So what can um, Seagate do as a device manufacturer? One of the things that I thought this community would be kind of interested to know, I think I have broached this subject before when I've talked to some of you, uh, we are really pushing for um, hard drives to go NVMe native. And there's a lot of different reasons for it. Our vision is that, uh, you know, data centers need to be a little bit more composable than it is today. So it's not always just hyper-converged. So storage being one part of it, but also memory as well as CPU compute can be more composable. And in order to do that, part of it is also about simplifying the stack so that it's not, you're not actually having, you know, SATA, SAS, and then now NVMe, different storage and compute stacks. So how do you want to consolidate all of it? So we, looking forward in the future, are really pushing for HDD to go native NVMe. And we have partnerships with other vendors that are part of the stack in order to simplify that. We are working with standardized, you know, standard bodies trying to actually implement some of the standardization that is needed. So how does it matter to the FreeBSD community and how um, you guys should think about it? If you are in the stack which talks to NVMe devices and you think that's going to be a fast uh, flash-based device only, which we also produce, by the way, but 
Uh, if that's the assumption that is that you're making while writing your device driver or your block layer scheduler or something like that, I, I request you to think a little bit outside the box because we are really hoping that uh, the command set and the stack gets consolidated. And so it's not so much, um, you know, we're, people are now managing different, you know, um, not only software stacks from an OS standpoint, but also for the hardware stack. And I know any software, I've written a lot of software, there are a lot of assumptions that go into it. <clears throat> so knowing the fact that these might be coming down the pipe, uh, we're really hoping that, um, you know, we're not gonna get blocked off uh, from a software side of things. We created a TPAR in the NVMe um, standardization body that got, I think, approved uh, in OCP, which is an open compute project. We are presenting uh, on Friday to talk some more about it as well. So you're welcome to come and be part of that um, as well. So we don't have, I don't have a date for you. I'm not from the product side of things, like when you will have a native NVMe HDD available but at least uh, we can, um, we, we are from a vendor perspective pushing towards that. So the other thing I think I've talked to you guys before <clears throat> is dual actuator. So the motivation there is that as we grow in capacity, which uh, if some of you may be aware, some of you not, we, we released the 18 terabyte drive, which has nine platters and 18 heads. It's a very complicated beast. But at the same time, the pipeline that is going into that hard drive is the same, which was you know a few years ago. So basically, your IOPS per terabyte are getting low and low. So last year we released the Mach 2, which is a dual actuator. Uh, it has gone to the you know satisfactory launch that we thought a new innovative product would do. I think I've talked to some of uh, the people who are attending this today about how we can make it easier um, for FreeBSD ecosystems to consume the dual LAN device. What I wanted to tell you guys today is that we're working on a SATA one coming pretty soon. Currently, it's already being standardized in the ACS uh, specs. I believe there is some discussion going on in the SAS spec to kind of make sure that the single LAN SAS would work out just fine. And where the complications come in is how the data is layout. So imagine if you have just one um, LUN or a SATA device with multiple actuators in the back, how does the device tell the, you know, the software stack how many actuators they are, how are they laid out? Would you want the control plane to actually look at the device and then make the decision on their own, how they want to lay out the data? Do you want the device to kind of figure it out on their own? So all of those are being discussed. But definitely we are going down that path and we will have something for SATA pretty soon uh, for people to kind of play out with. For the Mach 2 that is currently out there, there's still work uh, being done. I think we're working with some of the other communities like Linux community, trying to figure out the, you know, some of the storage uh, block their schedulers can be improved for a dual LAN. Because again, going back to whenever we were writing software, we always have assumptions. The assumption back then when they wrote those schedulers was a single one, a single spindle. That is not the case anymore. So going forward, how do we handle that? Um, another thing that ties back to the NVMe, NVMe has a whole concept of namespaces and we we're exploring how those namespaces and actuators kind of mesh together. Um, love to talk to you about it later. I know this is a whole topic on its own. There are people who do you know, an hour long presentations on how we have created this, um, this infrastructure and then, you know, how we can, uh, people want to know more about how the actual drive works and things like that. So with that, let me talk about something that is dear to my heart, which is observability. So first, let me just go a step back. Um, <clears throat> just talking to anybody who is uh, working in the data centers, having an autonomous data center is a nirvana everybody wants to go towards. There's a lot of open source software you guys probably are aware, like Prometheus, Grafana coming out of CNCF. They're all about observability. Um, I see a lot of active monitoring of uh, devices going on as, as well as you know, at, a, at a higher level. Uh, everybody wants to know what's going on with my you know, storage stack or you know, the whole infrastructure. And all of that depends on having the devices at the very end, be it, you know, uh, storage devices, network devices, RAM, anything producing the kind of telemetry 
that can be monitored, observed, and then decisions being made at an autonomous level. So we understand that there is a need um, and uh, we are trying to figure out how as a storage vendor, we can promote some of the stuff that we have in our devices. And especially since our devices become more and more complicated uh, as the devices are like you know 20 terabytes, 24 terabytes, 30 terabytes, we really wanna know what's going on in the device. We wanna monitor it closely. If you are um, you know, storing that amount of data on the device, uh, you want to know where your data is and how it's um, being stored and, you know, how the health of the device is, what is the workload like. So <clears throat> this is a grand vision, not necessarily where we are right now. Um, as you may know, there's uh, people like Blackblaze, for example, they share some of their data um, and many people download that data and make a lot of assumptions on it. If you are involved with any of the research work with Usenex and some of the other things, you would know that people take the data that Blackblaze is sharing and try to make a lot of data analysis or models out of it. The fear there is, is that that's only one, uh, one skewed look at the, the way uh, devices are used. So what we have done um, just to enable, the, the bigger vision is that we want to make it as open as possible people sharing their data. Uh, we're hoping to partner with foundations and uh, universities who are willing to host some of this data so that other data scientists can come in and take a look at it. So imagine if you had very detailed data about at the device level, CPU utilization, you know, RAM utilization, all of that. And then you can create data models based on that. How do you want to tier your um, you know, data within an infrastructure or even trying to figure out how quickly or how um, you know, predicting some of the device failure type of things. Uh, those are all the things that we would like to enable. So if um, we had a log called farm log, it's uh, just a field um, you know, reliability management type of log. It used to be under NDA. So we work really hard with all the people involved that was pouring information into that log and scrubbed it and now it's totally open. So it's published, the spec is published on our GitHub page. I know some of you are thinking, why not just make it standard like a smarter smart or something like that. If any of you have served in any of the standards body, you would know that it's a really hard problem to solve. There's a lot of people trying to do a lot of different things. So since we had something that we could quickly enable by opening it up, uh, we have actually done that. We have actually created tools and parsers that you can use, which by the way, work in FreeBSD that can parse the data uh, that is coming out of these devices, especially these are nearline high-end devices. And um, so you can actually see what's going on. There's workload statistics in there. There are head level statistics in there so that you can actually see if a specific head is, you know, getting more degraded than the rest of the device, uh, things of that nature. But what we really hope to do is that more and more people start sharing the data. Um, a lot of them, by the way, share it per, you know, on a one-on-one -on -one basis with Seagate and we provide them insight. But then again, it's a very one-on-one -on -one relationship um, in the spirit of openness and trying to actually be more transparent. We would love to partner with foundations that are willing to host such data and then create tools and um, infrastructures in place to for people to opt in, sharing the data in a very you know open way uh, with some of the licenses, which are all about hey, come take the data and actually um, create some models for it. So we do have some uh, things in the in the works that we are hoping in the future we can open, which is data models and inferences. Uh, but I don't know if how how far they will go because some of that data that is used to create those or is not open. So we're, we're really hoping to get some partnership out of it. If you're interested in this topic, feel free to reach out. I would love to talk to you some more about it. This is my last slide, and I'm hoping to kind of tell you about what else have we been able to do. There is a project called Cortex. Uh, we have open sourced it um, back in September. So it's fresh off the press, so to speak. More than a million lines of code, it's an object storage. So um, we had an object storage for our own products. And after a long internal debate, the, the 
the executive team agreed that it will be best that if you totally open source it. So it's a Apache based software defined object storage. All of it is available on our GitHub page. The community that uh, of engineers that are backing this are really excited that uh, Seagate was able to open source it. I've talked to them. They're always willing to help. Currently, we have some uh, major dependencies that we're trying to solve, and that's why it doesn't build on FreeBSD. I'm hoping in the future, when I come back and talk to you guys, I can report that it does build on FreeBSD. Currently, we're using Lustre and some kernel modules, which are very much tied to, um, to the Linux kernel. And our hope is that that dependency breaks sometimes next, next year. And we're hoping to actually be able to then build uh, on other you know, operating systems as well. Uh, if you are interested, if this is something that um, interests you, please feel free to come and um, you know, just create an issue. Just, uh, just say, hey, I would love to have this built on FreeBSD on our this so that our engineering team also gets an idea that there's, uh, there's an interest. At the end of the day, it's a uh, software stack that allows you to have an S3 um, you know, plug, so to speak. So when you run Cortex on a, 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 you know, on a platform, one of the, um, you know, what you can pretty much do what you do in an AWS S3 bucket. Uh, nobody kind of covers everything that S3 AWS provides, but we have a good coverage of that protocol available in the future. We're, thinking about adding some more uh, file and, and block layer type things to it. So uh, I wanted to mention it, even though it doesn't build on FreeBSD today, just to give you an idea that uh, from a company standpoint, we're really hoping to open more and more of our software assets. Uh, we are in the right direction and hoping to partner with you know, this foundation and FreeBSD project in general a lot more. So with that, uh, that was my last slide. Um, I think uh, I see one at least question. Do you think NVMe hard drives can meet same cost as SAS in your line? So <clears throat> we really hope that that would become the, the normal case. In the beginning, we will have, uh, we're hoping to have enough partners in play to, um, to create uh, a competitive product for for the the neoline uh, side of business, but overall, uh, in the end, you know, we'll, uh, SaaS is not going anywhere anytime soon. So both neoline SaaS and NVMe will probably go side in hand in hand. I'm hoping the cost would be like, hey, whichever uh, infrastructure you're you're uh, comfortable with deploying, and how mature the rest of the stack is, that people will make those choices based on that. I don't know what I'm doing on time. I think I'm a little bit early, so. It, um... We do have another question in the um, that came in from YouTube. If you want to check out the chat, um, Ed posted it. Okay, um, and if you want to just um, say it, I can just kind of reply to it that way. Okay, I can give it a go. Uh, they ask if there's any information on a slower perf on Mach that two drives under ZFS on the second LUN. Okay, so I, I think I see that there's a slower perf on Mark II drives under ZFS on the second line. Uh, okay, good. So I think this is coming from the ZFS folks. Um, we had a, uh, by, by the way, for those who don't know, we had a hackathon last year at the OpenZFS and I had some servers running with the Mach 2 and we noticed that there was a discrepancy on when you're running IOs on a Mach 2, which has two runs that the uh, LUN number zero was faster than LUN number one. So that's for those who don't know the issue, what, what we're at stake. So basically currently, since it was single port, um, the, uh, the answer that I got from the, the R&D team was that there is a hop involved. They are convinced that that hop should not have the, um, the, the skew that we were seeing between LUN zero and LUN one. Uh, there was a good bit of investigation that went into it. So basically, because there is a single port, all the commands go to one zero and then hop to one one, and therefore uh, one of them is a little bit um, slower than the other. 
they tell me that with the right cache enabled, uh, that problem should be much more better. It's uh, on me to actually go test it. I just haven't had time to go test what the new firmware and the new, um, you know, newer versions of the Mach 2 have come up to. So I'm hoping to give you guys feedback in, in the future. All right, so the question, another one that came in was, is Seagate working with Gen Z consortia on fabric solutions? Absolutely. So we're part of both the Gen Z and CXL. We believe that that's where the composability um, of the data center really lies. So uh, we're working together with them to see how memory can be addressed in a composable way in a data uh, the data center, as well as how storage is. Uh, my personal opinion, not Seagate's opinion, I think CXL would probably be the get there quicker, and then eventually we will get to um, to Gen Z. All right, uh, hard drives have uh, difficulty f uh, filling even a single PCIe channel. What Seagate's view on that will be connected to the host? So we personally think that it's not going to take more than one or two PCIe lanes, and so the way we're envisioning is is that. If you can remove um, some of the complexity in um, in actually supporting multiple, uh, you know, SaaS in in the same um, infrastructure for PCIe, then we're hoping in the future people will create architectures where they can, um, you know, they can let one of the lanes or two of the lanes go to um, hard drives, and I think. There are people way smarter than me in my group that are working towards trying to figure out how to enable that hardware piece. Um, and uh, hopefully that's where we're trying to actually go to some of the open uh, consortia and trying to actually hash this thing out. I believe um, now there's enough momentum. I, I go to them enough. When we were talking about NVMe HDDs a year and a half ago, we got a lot of pushback. Now it's actually being dis debated in, in um, you know, the right places, so to speak. So I think it's, it's um, I, I see a good future and I think it's gonna actually happen. All right, I see that's the last question I had. Yes, I think we're good. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Let me, cool. Thank you very much you. Um, for coming again this time. Uh, I think now we're headed into our next 10 minute break. Uh, and after that, we have a talk from ARM. So another 10 minute break, everyone.